Okay, welcome to the next uh, video tutorial, the third one in the sequence. So we're moving on to look at section B now. Um, this is the essay question on boy in the striped pajamas. Um, first of all, we're just going to look at um, some kind of just an overview, some key issues that you need to consider in your planning and preparation for the exam. Uh, just some explanation why I'd like to do this uh, section first. Okay, I think once you get this out of the way. Is the biggest bird in one continuous piece of prose, analytical writing, 44 minutes, and then you can go to section A and the reading on fiction, reading the newspaper article, and the letter to the editor. Okay, I think um, once this is out of the way, um, you know you can read the sigh of relief, and then move on to section A, and you can, it also helps because you don't have the novel in the exam. So you have to memorize some flexible quotations, five or six key quotes at least, um, that you can use on a range of te uh, themes or character-based questions. Obviously there's a limited number of questions you can be asked, so we're on a, probably a safe bet here. We'll consider the main options um, today. Okay. Um, so, first thing uh, to consider then is what type of questions exactly you could be asked. Um, so it could be based on character, obviously whatever the question is, you're going to be talking about characters. Um, there's Bruno there from the movie. Um, it could be based on themes like equality, obviously racism, prejudice, um, the Nazis and what they did, that's a key point, obviously. Um, and technique, okay, um, how John Boyne writes, um, how it makes the reader feel, what it makes them think about the, the characters, the situation. And it's been portrayed. Okay. Make sure you use his surname, Boyne, B O Y N E, if you want to talk about the author. Okay. Something you need to really uh, consider at some point during your essay um, is to mention a contextual factor. So you've got some notes on the the background um, to the novel, what was going on in um, Germany and Europe um, during World War Two and the run up to uh, World War Two, what happened to the Jewish people. And also the examples of genocide where um, uh, racism um, clearly goes um, to um, really quite extreme uh, lengths um, and such atrocities are committed. Um, so you can use your notes there, um, but this kind of background info is very, very useful and it does get you marks. It is part of the mark scheme um, at some point, um, and there will be plenty of opportunities to do this. Um, you can show some historical knowledge, some knowledge of context. That link in the top right hand corner there, you take that down with your pen and pencil. Um, that's a link um, that you can follow to an example of a lady um, who lost her son. Um, so she's talking about her account. It's a real person, a real interview, obviously a very emotional interview, um, about what happened to her Jewish lady um, during World War II and what happened to her family. Okay. Um, first thing we're going to look at then. Um, this clip, uh, let's give it back a bit. This is about um, Kristallnacht, uh, or Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. So this was in 1938, um, when the synagogues um, and the homes of Jewish people were ransacked um, and destroyed across Berlin, across Germany. Um, obviously, the official statistics that were put out um, probably slightly uh, misleading. Um, a number of people, um, upwards of 2,000 died um, of suicide or were murdered. Um, and those places of worship, the synagogues, um, were destroyed. They see some images there. Um, burned to the ground. And from there, the people, uh, the German uh, Jewish people, were moved forcibly, it uh, wasn't their choice, um, out of their homes um, and into the ghettos, cramped conditions. Um, appalling conditions, and then beyond that, they were then obviously uh, taken out on trains, as Shmuel was, um, to the concentration camps, um, where they, um, or the majority, um, met their fate in the gas chambers. Okay, so as these images show, the Nazis there in their uniforms, they publicly humiliated the Jewish people um, that occupied Germany. Um, Thousands and thousands of stores, Jewish owned businesses were destroyed, um, and they were literally cast out into the streets and then cast into exile. Okay, this comes as a result, remember, of the vilification um, of the 
the Jewish people. Um, their kind of skills and expertise in finance um, and really holding really high status, respected positions, they were used as a scapegoat, scapegoat for what happened to Germany um, post World War One, when really the country economically and uh, it really was uh, suffering. Um, so that kind of national mood, Nazis took advantage of that um, and pinned the blame there on the Jewish people. Okay. Now the next video. Um, this shows you Auschwitz, the actual camp. Um, just get back a second. Um, the camp where Shmuel um, is taken with his family. Remember, the families were split up. So he's there just in the male section um, with his father. Just pause it there. Um, his um, the rest of his family members, female family members, taken away from him. Um, that um, now famous expression there, they use on the gates, um, obviously to to dupe to fool um, the workers into believing they were just being used for their labour. Um, work uh, makes you free. Okay, trying to motivate the workers and control the workers, the Jewish people who were imprisoned there. Okay, uh, they're not prisoners. Remember, they're uh, sorry, they're not workers. They're prisoners. It's not uh, voluntary. Um, so they were taken into the camps by train and then sorted. Uh, remember, it wasn't just Jewish people, um, it was any minority group, um, so various um, ethnic minorities, um, homosexual people, gypsies, um, they were um, targeted as well. But the vast majority of those who, who died and who suffered were Jewish people. Okay, um, So they kept in these very barren, um, uh, kind of really soulless um, buildings um, in very, very uh, cramped, inhumane conditions, um, where they obviously suffered greatly. Um, and Shmuel, um, through his eyes, or through his story, um, Bruno's eyes, um, we get an account of one experience of Auschwitz. Okay, um, so you can see really um, what it was like. Um, the crematorium there, is where the bodies um, were disposed of. Um, remember, you're talking about. 1.1 million people in Auschwitz. Okay, on the the near the border between Poland and Germany. Okay. Okay. The next video. Um. So the next part of the presentation. Let's move on. Um. You have to consider um. John Boyne's techniques, how he writes, and the effects it has on the reader. So whatever question you get. You should try your best to talk about something that he does, and if you can put a label on it, um, that would be great. Um, that clearly affects the reader. So a technique that he uses may be the quotation that you're writing about. Okay. The first thing which we've discussed is use, uh, use of clothing as a symbol. It represents something else. So um, a really obvious example is the father's uniform, which he is very proud of. Remember, a lot of particularly young, misguided. Uh, youths in Germany were taken advantage of and you know you pin a uniform on someone and also they think they're important and um, perhaps they don't think too much about what they're actually doing. Um, so obviously what the Nazi uh, organization, the leadership the military committed was um, war crimes, atrocities, okay, indefensible. Um, so you've got Bruno's father in his uniform. Um, remember um, the whole family applauds aside from his grandmother, Bruno's grandmother, she Really, not a fan. She does not support what he's doing. She's disgusted by what he has done. Okay. Um, now, this is when Bruno is in the camp, chapter 19, the key one. You see the two different groups of people. People in the pajamas, remember that's the Jewish prisoners in their pr prison uniforms, um, who are crying unhappy, um, and the, um, the guards, the Nazis themselves, that are laughing and joking around. Maybe you, you can pause this video to take down the quotations. You think are particularly good. Remember, they have to be flexible. Okay. Um, another one, um, a mission. That means when you skip something out. Okay. Just a couple of examples of this. Um, when Boyne leaves a gap for the reader to fill in. Um, Maria talking about um, Pavel's background. Okay. Finally, um, Bruno is kind of trying to piece together this puzzle of what's going on in the camp and, and why those people are there. Um, but basically, uh, in chapter 13, if you find the page. Uh, Maria says, this is as much as I know, and then there's a gap, there's a break, and we don't actually hear what Maria says to Bruno. Okay, So there's that element of mystery, that intrigue, um, that the reader feels, um, you're put into the, the mindset, the viewpoint of Bruno, piecing to you, 
together things as he does. Okay, but obviously, um, the reader being more grown up and mature with the knowledge um, that they have, um, everyone knows about um, suffering of Jewish people in World War Two. Um, you work, work it out very quickly, but um, Bruno's perspective is very different on the world. Um, also, um, when Kotler beats up um, Pavel, obviously the violence is so um, extreme, it's almost indescribable, and um, that kind of disturbs Bruno, and he doesn't actually put into words what happens um, to Pavel. But, you know, the reader's imagination, you as a reader, we as readers, um, assume um, that it's the worst, okay? Um, we don't need words to paint that picture in a way it's more powerful to leave that gap, to omit that detail, okay? Another technique that we talked a lot about, um, just mentioned it there as well, a narrative viewpoint, the viewpoint from which the story is given, the account of the situation, okay? So it's not first person I, we are not inside the character Bruno, we're not that blinkered, okay? Um, but we do see most of the world um, through Bruno's eyes, okay, we follow him through the plot. Um, there are little kind of plot techniques like Bruno overhearing things and stuff like that, which um, kind of help to aid um, John Boyne to piece together um, this jigsaw puzzle. Um, and obviously, that's an incentive and motivation for the reader to carry on. Um, just a few points there, bottom left. Um, some of the things that he fails to understand or fails to pronounce correctly: the Fury for the Führer, Hitler. Uh, and out with for Auschwitz, which obviously could be suggestive of um, what the uh, Nazi people wanted to do um, to the Jews. They wanted to um, what we call ethnically cleanse um, their country, um, which is a kind of political euphemism, a nice way of saying that they wanted um, to get rid of them out with the Jewish people. Um, Bruno, bottom left there, doesn't understand why they have to turn lights off. Blackouts, obviously, because of bombings, they don't want the planes to see them. Um, they're trying to um, prevent the Allies uh, from being able to find out what's going on inside Germany. Um, there's something about the house, new house that made Bruno think there's nothing to laugh at and nothing to laugh about. Throughout the story, remember, he does sense that something is wrong, that something is disturbing and upsetting, um, unnatural and, and really awful. Okay? And that blank is something, that darkness is something that he delves into and we go with him. Okay? Um, another example. Um, he talks about his friends a lot, his, his three friends. He does kind of move on eventually and get used to Auschwitz, remember? Um, but that's his biggest concern at the beginning. And obviously, as readers, I know sometimes, um, and myself as a reader as well, he felt that he was, because he's a little bit spoilt, um, his view of the world can seem a little bit inconsiderate. Okay, but we do, he, we do warm to him, I think, in the opening chapters, or that was the writer's intention. Um, so that when what happens to him at the end happens, um, it has a stronger emotional effect on you. Okay, so there is mates that he's leaving behind. Um, some of the expressions that he fails to understand, Heil Hitler, he doesn't understand what that means at all. Okay, um, he takes it for granted, he assumes that it just means a pleasant afternoon, when obviously the significance of that um, is much more far-reaching. Another example. Um, he doesn't understand the significance of the Arbands, the um, Star of David David on um, Schmuel's armband, the six-pointed star, um, and the Nazi swastika, the Nazi symbol, um, on Bruno's father's armband. Obviously, they are polar extremes. You know, the experience of Nazis could not be further removed from the experience of the Jews. Um, it's the fact that he doesn't understand which one he wants um, really shows how in the dark he is, how naive and perhaps ignorant, but that's a bit of a strong term for a child, um, perhaps how naive he is about the situation, he doesn't know which one to choose, like choosing, um, you know, something, you know, choosing suffering and despair, um, or choosing um, freedom and luxury, and he doesn't know which. Um, he doesn't, um, Bruno wanted nothing more than to tell mother and father and Gretel, this is another thing, um, when he's first met, well, he wants to share his ideas, he wants to share